We have been so conditioned by the world that it is improper to talk about Jesus even to our closest friends. Peter and John were on their way into the temple to pray. They run into this guy. He's lame from his mother's womb. He's over 40 years old. There's not much hope for him. And as they walk in, they see this guy, and he reaches out and says, give me some money. And they say, well, we ain't got any money, but what we have, we'll give to you. And he reaches out and takes him by the hand and says, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he pulls him forth, and he rises up. His feet receive strength. His ankle bones receive strength. He jumps up. He runs through the temple. He's praising the Lord. And that drew a crowd, and the people came together to see what is going on. And when they looked, they saw it was that guy out by the gate all those years, and he's now healed. They're like, what is going on? And so he grabs Peter and John and pulls them to him as though these are the guys that healed me. And Peter speaks up and says, wait a minute. Don't look at us. We're not the ones who healed him. I see God doing that a lot. You know what he'll do? He'll do something big, draw a crowd, and then he'll send his boys in there to preach the gospel of Jesus. I love how God strategizes to get the gospel to a lost and dying world. In our world today, we spend a lot of time in churches a lot of churches are using all kinds of gimmicks and schemes and, and ways of getting people to come in and then preaching to them some feel-good gospel that doesn't change the world. Well, maybe it does, but not in the way we want it to. Maybe it waters down the gospel. Maybe it makes the, the power of the gospel benign in the hearts of those listening to the foolish preaching. And what we need today is men of God who will stand up and preach the Word of God and preach it with power and unction and preach it in a way that it is not watered down and preach not, not fearfully but fearlessly say this is what God says. You know, you know something else? It's not just the preachers that need to be that. It's the people who love Jesus Christ like you. We need to stop walking around and just being fearful and saying the name Jesus or to worship Jesus in public or to do anything. No, we need to be salty salt. I thought about naming this message unsalty salt. But with you guys here, I think I just call it salty salt because I believe a bunch of you are going to jump on board and come on, let's go tell everybody we know about the wonderful Savior who saved our soul. Amen? Amen. All right, so we look at this passage here, Acts chapter 3. Verse 13, and he says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate. You know what he's saying? He now is saying to the Jewish people who are there in the synagogue there to worship, or in the temple there to worship God, but they didn't know Jesus. And many of those thousands of people that were there they had lended their voice to say, crucify Jesus Christ. And so they see the Christians coming in as though they're somewhat of a, a cult group, if you will. He says, the God of Abraham makes it clear, we love the same God you say you love. And so he names who he is. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers. You know what he's saying? We are people of God. We believe the whole Old Testament. And that's what the Jews believed then. But they had misinterpreted it. They have watered it down. They have added stuff to it. They have interpreted it from their own point of view of what they want, what they like, and what they desire. Like we are doing with the New Testament nowadays. We need to stop it. We need to take the Bible and say, this is a holy book. We need to hold it up and say, this is the authority for the church. This is the authority for the preacher. This is the authority for every single person who says they love Jesus Christ. If you love him, you take his word. You read it, you study it, you learn it, and you live it for his glory. Amen. That's how it's supposed to be. And these old boys, when they stood up to speak, they were standing somewhat in enemy territory. Because there were thousands of those who would have loved to put them to death for what they were saying. But these boys were not afraid. They stood like men of God and they said, hear the truth. Our world needs the truth today, amen? Our world's gone crazy. I'm going to tell you something. We would rather believe lies than the truth. 
We would rather believe unverified lies than verified truth. And I, you don't think so? Look at our world right now. Oh, I could just go down the list and name it. Do I need to? Everybody knows. Everybody knows. You know what's lying. But we, we don't say nothing. We just let it go by so that we're not persecuted and we're taken care of without giving any thought to our grandchildren's future. Are y'all listening? Because we can live comfortably in this ungodly world and we can get by, keep our head down, let stuff go by and just duck it, duck it, duck it, say nothing. But what is going to happen to your grandchildren? What world are they going to grow up in? How far will Satan drag them off the trail? You've got to look past your nose to see what God wants to do in our lives and what Satan wants to do in your children's lives. I'm going to tell you something. Satan can get into your children's heart by forced entry or free entry. Free entry is when mom and daddy ain't got no backbone to stand up for the truth and teach their children what's right and what's wrong. And Satan has free entry into their life. When mom and daddy say, well, I, you know, I, my kid don't want to go to church, so I'm not going to take my kid to church. Are you a mama, a daddy? Are you a parent? Or are you just, where is your head? If you believe he is the almighty, he is the great one, he is the answer to all the world's problems. If you believe he is the one who can save your children's soul, what are you waiting for? Get them in church, teach them right. No, no, we need to be bold. We need to be courageous. We need to, we need to be assertive. And we need to say, here I stand on the word of God. I'm following him because this book is the record of truth. And so what did the liberals do about it? What did the ungodlies do about the Bible? They assaulted the Bible in so many different ways. They went against it in every lie they can come up with. We let them in schools, and they indoctrinate our children with all kinds of lies. And now it's more than just tell them there is no God because he's already out of the picture as far as most people are concerned. And then now they're teaching our children such ungodly uh, perversion that it's just so messed up now, and it ain't going to do nothing but keep getting worse. And what we have been through the years is we have been unsalty salt. You know what you do with unsalty salt? Jesus said unsalty salt is cast out to be trotted under the foot of men. You know where the church is today of unsalty salted people? They are kicked out. They are not in society, in school, in public, in any square whatsoever. We're kicked out and we're trotted under the foot of ungodly men. That's where unsalty salt winds up. What do you want to be? I want to be salty salt. How about you? And salty salt makes a difference. And sometimes it makes, a, it makes a good difference. You ever add a little bit of salt to that beef stew? Mm -mm, mm -mm. My grandma used to make beef stew. I'm going to tell you what's the truth. And she knew how to make it right. And uh, my wife makes it now, and she makes it even better. And so, but, but, but you got to put a little salt on it. And that salt makes it taste so much better. Our world would be so much better if Christians would be salty salt. And it don't take a majority to make a difference. I mean, like Grandma and, and Kim, they don't dump half beef stew, half salt. You don't need it. All you need is a little bit to make a difference. And the little bit is you. We can make a difference in this world. And if you don't believe it, you look at the ungodly crowd. You know what percentages they are compared to the whole population and what a difference they're making because they're loud and they're out forth and they're letting everybody know what they believe and they stand tall even though others criticize them and rail against them, but they stay and they keep going and they keep preaching their ungodly stuff. I'm talking about ungodly people out there saying things like men can become women and women become men and all that nonsense and they, they just look you dead in the face and say lies like that and you say, oh, Jeff, that's harsh. Let me show you harsh. Watch this as I teach. You see, we can't fix the lies if we ain't straight up about the truth. Do you feel it just sounds so bad? Uh, does it really sound that bad compared to what this ungodly world has taken us to at this time? Look, I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't, I don't want to be mean. I don't want to be hateful, but I want to be truthful. And if it sounds bad, I can't help it. But I don't want to offend a soul. But I'll tell you something. The gospel of Jesus Christ, it does offend, and here's why. It is the truth about what God thinks about our sin. Sinners don't like to hear that. But people whose heart is warm toward God, they say, I just want to know what do you want with me? What do you think of me? Where do I need to correct? How can I get better? I want to be in your graces. I want to be what you want me to do. I want to live for you. Not we live for him so that we might be saved. I have to say this because somebody can come back and say, oh, you're preaching works. I am not. I'm preaching 
respect. You're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God. So we accept him by faith. What do we accept? His blood sacrifice to wash our sins away. We accept that his sacrifice is sufficient to save our soul. And we believe him, and because of that, we work for him out of a life of appreciation, respect, awe, a holy fear of God. And we say, I will live for you. And we hold our hearts up to God, and we say, my God, search me and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of righteousness. Verse 14, but you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, he's saying, that you stood outside Pilate's gate, and Pilate said, who do you want? I can deliver one of these to you, and they could be free. The other one I will have to crucify. Do you want Jesus or Barabbas? Barabbas was a murderer. He was a, he was a terrible person in society. He said, do you want Jesus or do you want Barabbas? They said, give us Barabbas. Free Barabbas. They want to free a murderer. He says, what shall I do with Jesus? Crucify him. Verse 15, and killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead of which we are witnesses. You know what he's saying? He's saying, instead of taking the prince of life as freedom and living for him, you took a murderer, accepted him over the one and only Messiah. Messiah being the Christ, the Lord, the one acceptable, the only one God has ever sent to save anybody, the one that the Jews have looked for for all of, all of their time, looking for this Messiah who would come and take away the old sacrificial system where you're killing lambs and doves and, and bullocks and all the rest. But Jesus dies once and for all for all sins, and we don't have to make those sacrifices anymore. And the Jews have been looking for this Messiah all this time. And when he came, instead of accepting the Messiah, Jesus Christ, he accepted a murderer instead. How foolish could they be? I remember reading some of these passages when I was young, saying, how could they do such a thing? How could they be so foolish? And now I look at our society today and say, oh, I see. I see how it is. You know, Satan gets in through our convenience. Satan gets in for our, through our, our wants. Satan gets in through our uh, misdirected love. And he messes with your head. And the less you read the Bible, the easier the job is for the devil to work in your life and in your children's life and in your grandchildren's life. And God wants to do amazing things through you. You say, who am I? I'm nobody. Well, uh, I know that God is nobody. I know what I was before I was saved. He saved my soul. And I know what he has done over the past bunch of years in my life that I ain't nothing. You wouldn't believe how inadequate I am to preach the gospel. You would not believe it. But all I said is, God, I'll take the next step. All I said is, I will keep going for you. Whatever it is, just show me how. And in my own broken way, I do the best I can, and God just makes it happen. I don't understand. I don't get it, except it's God who does it. If you work, if I work, if we work in our own power, we get nothing done. But if we work in the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results to God, he'll do miraculous things in our lives individually and especially corporately as we work for God to be that salty salt. He says, you killed Jesus. You killed, listen, is it... Is this sweet talking to them? Is this making sure their feelings are okay? You killed Jesus, who God raised from the dead. That's pretty hard preaching. That was offensive to them. Do you think? What if it was you? Would you not? Oh, he was ringing their bell, beating them like a drum. Peter and John, who were standing before them, we're witnesses. What does it mean? We were with Jesus before he died on the cross. We listened to his teaching. We didn't quite understand it all, but we, we, we witnessed his teaching. We saw it. We were with Jesus when the mob took him out and they tried him and, and hung him on a cross and Jesus died. And we know Jesus was graveyard dead. And three days later, we are witnesses of the fact that he rose from the grave because he appeared to us alive from the dead. And not just in spirit, but he physically appeared to us sat down and ate with us, showed himself alive for over 40 days. We know he's alive because we're witnesses of him. And the evidence that the disciples were witnesses of Jesus Christ is that before they were scared to death 
And once they saw Jesus alive from the grave, now they are out in public and power of the Holy Spirit on them. And they're standing there preaching in the power of the Spirit and don't care whether they get crucified just like Jesus did. They knew about his 40 lashes. They knew about him being absolutely physically filleted as they beat him half to death. And then as he hung on a cross, they knew all about that. And they said, I'm going to talk about it if you, even if you do that to me. But here we are as Christians. And we're saying, I'm just going to be right quiet. I'm just not going to let everybody know. I'm, I'm just, but I love you, Jesus. But you're a secret servant Christian. You're, you refuse to be that salty salt that says, I want the whole world to know what Jesus Christ has done in my life. And if he hasn't done anything, then you need to be talking to him very clearly and listening to him very intently that he might do some things in your life like save your soul, put his spirit down in your soul, get you right and ready for heaven. But if you've been saved and you know the power of God, don't, don't keep it a secret. You be out and loud about Jesus. You don't have to be obnoxious. You just tell the truth. It'll take care of itself. I mean, you don't have to try to be offensive. Just tell the truth. It'll take care of itself. I talk to people so often about Jesus Christ, and I do it unapologetically. I do it loud and clear. And let me just tell you something. You say, well, I witness. I invited somebody to go to church next week. I ain't talking to you about inviting people to church. I love for you to invite them to church. It's good to have a lot of people here. Many of you are here because somebody invited you, and I think it's important to invite people, but they ain't witnessing. Witnessing is whenever you speak about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When you talk to somebody about how that Jesus came into your heart and saved your life, you, you talk about how Jesus, God sent his son to die on the cross, and you're looking him in the eye, and he came to die on the cross to wash your sins away. That's gospel preaching. That's gospel teaching. That's real witnessing. And you say, oh, it's so hard. Make it easy. I I'll make it easy. And you walk with God, you pray to God, you talk to God, you let God work in your life. And then when you talk to somebody, all you got to do is tell them what Jesus has done in your life. You, you don't even have to go to the, the preaching part at all. I don't mean, you know, I'm just saying, you know what I do? I talk about how he has blessed me. I, I just, I'm in casual conversation talking to people and I, I just say, my God has blessed me. So let me tell you what God did in my life. And then I'll tell them how he's done this for me or that for me. And then I'll, I'll begin to, I don't, I don't put them on trial. I just simply let them know that I believe with all of my heart that God is actively involved in my life and he can be actively involved in yours too. And I clearly share the gospel of Jesus Christ very, very often. Say, of course you do. You're a preacher. I was sharing it before I became a preacher. Salty, salt is Christians who ain't afraid to speak about the one who washed their sins away. Salty salt is Christians that ain't afraid to speak of that about the one who's coming back for them one day to take them on to be with him in heaven forever. The problem is most people don't really believe what they say they believe because they keep what they believe silent, which I'm not sure you believe. But these boys believe because they saw Jesus alive from the dead. And so he says, yet now, brethren, I mean, like right now, I know that you did it in ignorance. You didn't know what you was doing. You know, Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. You did it in ignorance as also your rulers. Verse 18, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of his prophets. In other words, the prophets already said what was going to happen. You should have been listening that the Christ would suffer as he has fulfilled. In other words, here's a prophecy that, that the Messiah that you're looking for is going to come in this world, and he's going to suffer. And he turns to them and says, you see, this happened. Jesus died on the cross. The evidence is all over it. The truth is certainly there. People are in the conviction. And that's why Peter said, verse 19, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. So repentance is when you turn from unbelief to belief. They did not believe Jesus was the Messiah, was the Savior. They would not believe in him. And he says, you repent. And repentance is whenever you say, yes, I do believe in him. Yes, I believe Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the hope for all of humanity. And so they repented. Many of them did. In fact, the Bible will go on here in a minute. You'll see it. 5,000, just the men. We don't have any children, how many wives. We don't know. But 5,000 people believed, were repented and were saved. That is huge. How many people spoke? There was just two, Peter and John, and 5,000 souls were saved. How many people were there? I don't know, but 5,000 people saved. 
thousands on thousands of people there. And them boys stood up in front of all those who would stone them, who would crucify them, who would destroy their life. They stood boldly as salty salt would, and they shared the clear message of the greatest message ever preached about the greatest day that ever happened, and that is the death, burial, but the resurrection, that Jesus is alive. And if he's alive, should not our salt be salty? Should we not proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ with a steadfast faith that no matter what they say to me, no matter what they do to me, I am going to let the world know my faith is in Jesus Christ, the one who saved my soul. I know he's real. I know what he's done. You need to be doing that. Now watch. He goes on and he says in verse chapter 4 and verse 1, now, as they spoke to the people, now that you got a picture of this, they're, they're preaching at the temple. The temple has rules. And one of the big rules is you don't preach about Jesus Christ because we crucified him and we don't want y'all talking about Jesus. They wanted Jesus just to go away. And now as they spoke to the people, the priest and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in the name of Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They said, oh, no, 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 you can't preach that here. Why? Because if Jesus truly rose from the grave, those religious leaders are out of business. They lose their authority. They lose their, their name. They lose their reputation because they killed the Prince of Life, Jesus Christ. Those preacher boys really didn't care if it was going to mess up their reputation. They cared that all these thousands of people are following a lie that Jesus is not who he said he was, the Messiah of the world. Being greatly disturbed, they taught the people and priests and Jesus the resurrection from the dead, and they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day. However, many of those who heard the word believed. Oh, the damage is done. People heard the gospel, and they believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000 people were saved. What would God do if a crowd this size right here said, from this day forward, Wherever I go, whatever I do, I'm going to live my life to honor God. And when somebody asks me for a reason of the hope that is in me, I'm going to clearly share with them the wonderful words of life that God sent his son to save my soul. And I gave Jesus my life, and he saved me, and he could save you too. You should give Jesus a time, a thought. You should meditate on who. That's what you do when you witness. You should think about this Jesus and research this and study it. You'll learn. And then explain to them, I put my faith in his death, burial, and resurrection. I put my faith in him to save my soul. Not my works, not my abilities, none of that. I put my faith in him to save my soul, and he saved my soul. That's how you witness to people. You let them know. I mean, let me ask you something. Why do you think it's so easy to invite somebody to church? Or why do you think it's so easy to talk about a sporting event? Or why do you think it's so easy to talk about anything in this whole wide world, but it's hard to talk about the death, burial, resurrection, Jesus changed my life? Because there is an evil force, a demonic power that is pressing against you and saying, you cannot speak. You might lose your reputation. You might lose your job. You might lose your friends. If I can follow him and lose everything else, it's okay. And don't matter what you ever give up, you can't out give God. When you give something up, God will multiply back to you what you gave up. And I have lived to see that true. They're on trial now. In verse 7, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a deed done in this helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known unto you and to all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man stands here before you whole. You talk about throwing fire on the subject. Man, they didn't care if they upset them. Why? Because the truth is so important. It's okay if it messes with somebody's feelings. Listen, we are a feeling led society and the Marxists have used feelings to mess us up to dictate how we think 
And what we need to do is just say, let's look at our Bible and say, what are you saying? And then let's share that with people and not worry so much about feelings. I mean, it wasn't like they were trying to upset them. They were just trying to tell the truth. And when you tell the truth, it, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's salty. You ever put salt in a wound? Ooh, this is what's offensive to the world around us. I mean, you can be any other religion, any other group out there, and it's okay. But when you start saying that you're a Christian, you believe the Bible, you have enemies immediately. Why? Because we believe that there is one name, and it is the name of Jesus by which we are saved. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Why? Because he died on the cross to wash our sins away. He was buried, and he rose from the grave and is alive today. And that offends people, and that's okay. What's not okay is for us to water down the gospel so the world will come to our church and feel comfortable. We're not into that. What we're into is preaching the truth. If I love my children, I will tell them the truth. If I love my grandchildren, I will tell them the truth. If I love my neighbor, if I love my enemy, I'm going to tell them the truth. Amen? I mean, how many of you want to live your life on a lie? If you're deceived, don't you want somebody to come tell you the truth? Absolutely. Now they are in their council and they're discussing, what will we do with these people who are talking about Jesus Christ? What, what are we going to do? I mean, like, they are spreading this gospel all around. And so they are saying about the Christians, they said, uh, verse 17, but so that it spreads no further among the people, hey, let us severely threaten them, not just threaten them, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. You know what he's saying? We got to shut them Christians up. We got to shut the Christians up. We can't let them be talking about Jesus. Didn't you hear this today? Didn't you hear this today? And you don't even hear it out in society much now. You hear it in your own heart. We have been so conditioned by the world that it is improper to talk about Jesus even to our closest friends. So many of you out here, you have friends that are lost and you're not willing to talk to them about Jesus. So many of you here, you, you, won't, you won't dare uh, let anybody know that you're really devoted to Jesus Christ. You know why? It may be that you're not really devoted to Jesus Christ. You're not salty salt, you're unsalty salt, and you need to get that right and you need to do it today. Verse 18, so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Can you imagine this? You can't talk about Jesus. Can you imagine it? Of course you can. Because that's where we're at today. Uh, you can't talk about Jesus in the public schools, but you could talk about all kinds of ungodly, perverse sexuality and all kinds of ungodly ideologies, all kinds of ungodly uh, explaining Jesus' way. It is not teaching our children just to indoctrinate them with a godless philosophy about how this world was created without God. We should allow debate, healthy debate helps people's brains to work better. And we should allow them to teach creation versus evolution. They say, don't you talk about Jesus. Verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. This is the verse you need to circle. This is the verse you need to understand. You need to read it. You need to adopt it. You need to live it. Verse 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. The question is, have you seen anything? Have you heard anything? Do you know what God has done? You maybe say, well, I didn't see him alive from the dead. Have you seen him come into your life and save your soul? Have you seen him make a difference in your life? Can you here today say, if it weren't for Jesus, my life would be disastrous? Anybody here can say that really? Say amen. amen. All right, so if it weren't for Jesus, your life could, would be disastrous. Mine certainly would. But then think about this. Jesus said, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And ain't you glad somebody told you about Jesus and you were able to be saved? Don't you think you should tell somebody about Jesus that they might be able to be saved? That's what we need to do. Though the whole world says, don't you, don't you do it. Don't you talk. Don't you do it. You say, I'm going to preach about Jesus. I'm going to teach about Jesus. I'm going to... Talk to other people about Jesus Christ. I ain't asking you to step up on the, on the, in front of everybody and just go to preaching like a preacher does. I'm just asking you to be real. If you love Jesus Christ, don't hide it. Talk about who changed your life. Talk about who means the most in your world. Let people know 
that you have a faith in Jesus Christ and you ain't, you ain't going to be bought by nobody and you ain't going to be silenced by nobody. You believe the Word of God is true and Jesus saves and you're just going to live your life out living for Jesus and as you cross and talk with people that come to you with needs or questions, you're able to talk to them about Jesus. Why? Because He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through Him. The world needs to know Jesus today. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray for each person here. I pray for those souls that are here that are Christians but are watered down. I pray, Father, they'll not be offended, but rather they will be confronted. And they'll look at the sin of silence that they might get along. And I pray, Father, they will repent of that right here today. That they would turn to you and say, My God, I'm sorry I dishonored you with my silence. And I pray, Father, if there are people here today that are not Christians, I pray, Lord, that you would convict them and compel them to give their life to the only one who can save them. Nobody else out there can. But they would turn their life to Jesus and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. God, help them to do that right here, right now, today. Let them be saved. We'll give you all the praise and the glory for what you're about to do here. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.